Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off discussing AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution, which is being heralded as the competitor to NVIDIA's DLSS. For those who don't know what DLSS is, although I suspect most do, deep learning super sampling takes a lower resolution image, let's say 1080p, and then upsamples it to a higher resolution output. And this is tremendous for games, of course, because if you're trying to render internally at 1080p, it's considerably fewer pixels, much less work for the GPU than trying to render at 1440p. And DLSS 2 has been pretty damn successful for NVIDIA. DLSS 1 had, let's say, flaws, but DLSS 2 is actually pretty darn good. I've discussed this more at length in a DLSS 2 focused video, and also the rise of machine learning why native resolution is dead. I'll try to remember to link both of those in the video description. Nevertheless, AMD have been somewhat cagey regarding Fidelity FX Super Resolution. They simply mentioned it during CES, at least officially, stating that it's currently in development and to stay tuned as they would be collaborating with games developers. I myself had also, of course, mentioned it last year and said that, to my knowledge, the quality didn't look to be as good as DLSS, but it was coming on and seemed to be pretty impressive for what it was, although we'll get to how the implementation allegedly works in just a moment. AMD have also stated that this technology does work for the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, as well as RDNA 2 class GPUs. However, there is actually a leak from ProHardVer, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. I'll link to their website in the video description. According to them, they believe that we will start hearing more about Fidelity FX Super Resolution in March, with the driver update being somewhere in the springtime. And also, apparently, a large driver update would also boast another thing, and that is Radeon Boost. As Radeon Boost basically uh, dynamically changes the resolution depending what's going on in the game. Now, to my knowledge, Originally, the plan had been, or at least the hopeful plan had been, to release this technology around the time of the RX 6700 XT. And AMD, of course, have officially stated that that's going to be the first half of the year. However, I am hearing that there may be some delays, so I don't know if this release date is accurate or not. Personally, I heard it could be even later than this, but again, at the end of the day, you know, their information could be solid. And I think what it basically says is that their tech is not going to be, that is AMD's tech, is not going to be releasing tomorrow or anything like that. I'll also say that as to how it works, from my understanding, it's rather different to NVIDIA's. So NVIDIA uses training and inference. In a nutshell, training is where you're actually training the neural network. That is, you take a whole bunch of lower resolution images, or gameplay, I suppose, and then use the neural network to upsample it to whatever the native resolution is. It does so by basically comparing the low resolution image to the high resolution image and saying to the neural network, no, you're a bad neural network, you didn't do that right. And the neural network kind of, you know, looks all sad and keeps doing it again and again and again until eventually it gets it correct. And then obviously that trained code then could be run on your local GPU because uh, training is much more uh, intensive. And that's why NVIDIA utilizes their supercomputers to do this. However, AMD doesn't seem to utilize the same technology. It seems to be upsampling basically in real time. Now, this is not exactly how it works, but you can think of it more along the lines of what, say, it's happened with consoles. So, for example, temporal ups uh, upscaling or whatever else. It's not exactly like that, but it was kind of explained to me that that's basically how it happens, at least in real time. Although it's still utilizing machine learning, to my knowledge anyway. It's basically using lower precision operations on the GPU to upsample from lower resolution. Although, again, there is still a bit of confusion as to how it works exactly. I was told that the performance is actually pretty decent. After all, again, you are upsampling from a lower resolution, let's say 1440p to 4K, which naturally does save you an awful lot of performance. However, what it doesn't do is utilize NVIDIA's tensor cores or their own technology. We've clearly seen AMD patent MLA, or machine learning accelerators, but this is a chiplet, and according to my even recent leaks, I'll put out the link to my video a couple of days ago, 
MLA is not even going to be present in the RDNA 3 architecture. I'm hearing that there's going to be just two chiplets on that. And now switching from AMD's GPUs to their CPUs. And there's actually a rumor from the website Chips and Cheese. I'll link to their website in the video description. And they have reportedly sources who have told them that Genoa, AMD's next generation server processors, are going to be pretty darn speedy. They are going to be considerably faster than what we have with Zen 3. I'm going to read this out for Baton. Zen 4 is what a lot of people are waiting for, and if the info I have is accurate, the wait will prove to be even more worth it. It is important to note that one common thread in all Zen 4 chatter I have heard is resounding positivity. From IPC gains over 25% and the total performance of over 40 and even possibly finally 5 GHz or core, thanks to the new full node N5 fabrication at TSMC. Now I can't say what is true and what is over-exaggeration. However, I was told from a trusted source that Genoa engineering sample Zen 4 server clock was 29% faster than Milan Zen 3, with the same core config at the same clocks. Factoring what I've heard about the possible clock gains that N5 will enable over N7, and Zen 4 sounds like it's going to be a quote monster of a CPU, end quote. Now, yeah, I'm not sure that we're going to see 5 gigahertz, and this is my personal opinion on a server part, particularly when you start to get to the higher core counts, like, let's say, 64 cores, I feel that that may be ambitious. I did, however, put out my own exclusive recently regarding Zen 4, Genoa, and also some other bits and bobs, including Warhol, and to my understanding anyway, Genoa is actually looking to be really good for certain. I was actually told that IPC gains are definitely pretty impressive. I was told that they're kind of in line what we saw with Zen 1 to Zen 2, so around 20-ish percent. So again, their statement of 25 is not ultra unreasonable. It does, of course, heavily depend when you're talking about IPC as well. What are you testing? And obviously different applications test the CPU in various ways. As I went more extensively into in my previous video, that one of the big changes with Genoa is not necessarily the IPC gains from one architecture to the next. It's going to be a lot of fundamental changes to the processor. For example, DDR5 alone is going to be a massive net benefit and, well, just going to drastically increase performance in specific applications when you start to factor in the memory bandwidth limitations of higher core count workloads. I want to stress that... Uh, I still feel that 25% is a bit much for the IPC gain over Zen 4, but, you know, we'll wait and see. I'm personally expecting it to be around 20%, but I would be I would be really happy to see myself proven wrong here. And as for the IPC gains of Zen 5, well, according to this, we could be looking at two and a half to three times the IPC of Zen 1. I'll point out the really obvious thing. First of all, that's a blisteringly high number. And second of all, just like I mentioned a moment ago, it does depend on how you're counting IPC. Maybe if you're referring to floating point performance, given what we've seen with the architecture, I could possibly see that. But just as a general number, it does sound rather high to me. I've reached out to a couple of sources and they are somewhat sceptical of the two and a half to three times number, but again, I would love to be proven wrong, and honestly, I've not really heard that much information about Zen 5 at the moment, so I don't have enough evidence to say that it's not true, I would just say that it sounds rather ambitious to say the least. I also had it hinted that, you know, Zen 4 could definitely have higher core counts. In fact, I was even stating this last year, but one of the reasons AMD did not raise the core count for Ryzen 5000, well, back then, of course, we were calling it 4000 series, was quite simply because they didn't feel they needed to combine this with the fact that they just really couldn't with only a dual-channel memory configuration. Uh, obviously, if you're running your uh, 5950X, for example, with really fast memory, 4000 megahertz plus, you know, even more would be ideal, then, yeah, then, you know, you're pretty much feeding it a good amount of data. But imagine if you were to increase the core count further still to, let's say, 24 cores. That would mean some very interesting things. 
Also, a smaller thing regarding AMD, since we're already on that AMD train, we might as well just keep going through to the next station. According to Patrick on Twitter, I'll of course link his tweet in the description, AMD is working on a combo AM5. Now, he later added clarification to what this actually meant, and he said, and I quote, simply said, instead of having one UEFI for each platform, they put the firmware for multiple platforms into one UEFI. So I guess combo stands for combination, or something like that. So he doesn't seem to be implying that uh, Warhol is going to be both DDR4 and DDR5. As I was uh, discussing again in my video from a couple of days ago, Warhol is definitely one of those weird platforms, at least for me. It's kind of strange in leaks and this kind of uh, thing that I do, honestly, with analysis, because sometimes you get the information which should be really not what you get first, like, as I was mentioning, the release date for Warhol, which is going to be this year, but then the actual thing that you'd expect to be the easiest thing to ascertain, the actual platform, I can't get it. Um, I have an idea it's still AM4, uh, because I've had more people tell me that the CPU does still utilize DDR4, so I'm less certain of that, so I'm not going to put it out there and say that uh, I do think the Warhol is AM5 or AM4. I honestly am not 100%. And one last thing, since uh, we've talked about all this other cool stuff, let's have one non-AMD piece of news. Let's throw it in here. The RTX 3060 non-TI, which of course has 12 gigabytes of memory, it's going to launch on the 25th of February. And this is according to information by WCCF Tech. I actually did a bit of digging into this and it does seem to be the correct release date for the RTX 3060. Although to be fair, Nvidia did officially state that these cards do launch, well, basically by the end of this month. They said kind of endish February. So that generally would mean around that date anyway is what you would kind of expect. I'm also hearing that the availability is not too bad with the RTX 3060, but of course that would be typically, and with all of the shortages that we've been experiencing, and I won't go into that whole thing, but yeah, uh, I fully expect these things are going to sell out. One of the negatives of the RTX 3060 is that, in a nutshell, there is no founders edition model. I don't know how that's going to play out with the prices. Obviously, retailers have put some cards already available. You know, they've kind of listed the prices. And they're not <laughs> they're not looking great, to be honest. And it's kind of like... I'm, I'm interested, actually, in your opinions on this, guys. Like, let me know below. When it comes to buying a graphics card, do you buy the premium version? Or do you just buy, like, the base entry model? I've actually had this discussion with a couple of AIBs, and even NVIDIA, actually. And, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm probably going <laughs> to get some AIBs frowning at me for this one. But my personal opinion is, it's like, if you're buying, like, let's say you're, you know, really, you know, uber wealthy, and you can buy, like, the premium RTX 3090, and maybe you want to get it with the water block, or maybe you just want to buy the card that's got the highest clock frequencies, or, you know, makes you sandwiches or whatever, then, you know what, 100% cool. I start to have issues, though, with a card such as the 3060, where, you know, the MSRP is, like, 300 and, what is it, 330? 330? Yeah, 330. But then the majority of the samples start to creep up to the next pricing tier. And I kind of have this, like, in any card. Like, I'm only picking on the 3060 since we were just talking about it. This could be in any generation. Hell, going back to Pascal, Maxwell, you know, bloody Polaris, Fiji, doesn't matter. I do have this kind of thing of, like, okay, certain AMD cards or, <laughs> yeah, certain uh, NVIDIA cards, hello 400 series, they are not exactly the best if you're running them with a, you know, a kind of a, a very entry-level cooler. But in general, I don't really believe that, you know, all of these different card models are exactly a great thing. That's just my opinion. I personally, if I'm buying my own card, I typically just kind of cheap out and buy like the, not necessarily the cheapest GPU, but not the best. And that's just kind of like, you know, my personal take on that. So I'm curious to hear what you think about it too. With that said, thank you very much for watching the video. Uh, 
feeling a little bit out of it today to be honest with you so i'm not feeling 100 percent, which is one of the reasons i'm not on camera but uh, hopefully it's just uh not not you know the bubonic plague but with that said thank you very much for watching the video anyway i will see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now